All right, let's go ahead and get started. So hey, this is uh, functional testing your Grails app uh, with Jeb. So we're going to focus mainly on Jeb today. The uh, Grails app part is pretty, you know, it's a web application. So um, we're going to look at some of the plugins, um, or some of the plugins, yeah, the Jeb plugin and uh, how to use it uh, today. So um, I like to have things, you know, interactive. So if you have a question, if we're in the middle of something, we want to, you feel free to speak up, do something. So I know it's like, we should be like, the, the, the conference, the session section after lunch is like food coma land. And you know, it's, it starts to get warm and people start to like drift off for a minute. But I think we're probably past that. We're just, you know, a little bit past the food coma land. Although Mort was saying that, uh, uh, I, I got to throw something at him if, uh, if he falls asleep. So if I'm chucking something at him, you know why, right? <laughs> All right. Um, who am I? I'm uh, Colin Harrington. I'm a principal consultant with Object Partners out of uh, Minnesota. So we do consulting around Groovy Grails, some uh, iOS, um, high... Uh, some enterprise uh, development. I personally like to work with early stage companies, uh, startups, that type of thing. Help build teams and new products, uh, iron things out. Uh, big fan of testing, um, if you've seen uh, any of my other work. So uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, uh, Colin Harrington, uh, or uh, send me an email. So Jeb, all right. Who knows what Jeb is? Just come in here. Okay, so we have a pretty good idea. Um, who has used Jeb before? All right. Who is using Jeb in their current product right now? Okay, so a good amount of people. All right. So Jeb, notice I didn't say Geb or Gabriel or, Gub or whatever, Gub or I don't know. Jeb, like a J-E-B. Yeah, it even says that on the website, right? Pronounced Jeb, just, just in case you weren't clear. <laughs> so um, you can find the website at uh, jebish.org. They've got some decent docs. Um, or uh, it's on GitHub, and they've got some examples and some other stuff up, out there. So it's uh, quite useful. So the basic level, Jeb, just to distill it, is effectively groovy plus web driver plus a jQuery-like syntax and this page object model thing. If you had to summarize it it's and boil it down to one function, that's about, about what it is, right? So Groovy is the language, WebDriver's the library that we're using, and then we've got some extra help around you know, the selector model and some other integrations uh, involved in there. And what sets uh, Jeb apart from some of the other tools that are in the uh, Ruby world, even, is this uh, page object model, you know, uh, as we'll see in a, in a minute. All right. So let's back up a little minute. Um, so Jeb was started, uh, first commits were actually in 2009 uh, by Luke Daly. You know, his first cut of Jeb was, you know, what he thought it, it could be. Um, 2010, there was a bunch more development. I think it went 01 in, sometime in 2010, like July or some, sometime there. Um, we're currently at a 0.9.2, and uh, we're, we're looking, uh, looking towards 1.0. Just like winter, it's coming. Any Game of Thrones fans here? Yeah, yeah, don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. <laughs> All right. So what's Jeb useful for? Um, primary usage is for some form of automated testing. So we write big web applications. We need something to test these web applications. You know, kind of as Java folks from the past, we're familiar with unit testing, right? So that's, you know, one perspective. Um, this functional testing where you're testing your whole entire web application is a different thing, a different bird. So that's one major use. Another major use uh, that I've seen it uh, used for is uh, screen scraping and automating things, right? You know, automating going out to somebody's website and, you know, pulling down this, you know, the latest quote of whatever, you know, in some form, uh, automated form. Um, any other uses? Who's using some Jeb for something else? 
Nobody? Yeah? Oh, yes. Okay. Now that was awesome. You know what? I got I to gotta find that because that was totally awesome. YouTube, um, Cedric, uh, Shem. Let's go 2048. If you haven't seen this, this is actually really awesome. So uh, Cedric created a, um, that was n working on Dodge. <laughs> yeah, how about the original video? Where was that? Yeah, I gotta wait for uh, wireless. Here is awesome, huh? <laughs> so effectively, he wrote um, something to automate um, playing the game Twenty Forty Eight. If you guys have 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 you seen the, the game Twenty Forty Eight? Okay, if if you have some time to burn. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. If you don't have time to burn, do not even th just ignore whatever I'm going to say right here. So um, there's a game called 2048, <laughs> uh, put out on GitHub, pretty uh, popular where you, um, <laughs> uh, screw <the laughs> you basically combine numbers and try to get up to as high as you can go. And here I've already got 2048, so I guess I kind of you know, give that picture away. But you start off with uh, simple squares, and you can combine them, like a four and a four makes an eight, and so it's base two math. Um, it's incredibly addicting. You will get lost in it for a while, if you haven't already, so. So um, Cedric wrote a solver in uh, using Jeb, effectively. Right? So here's the video of his solver. It was all automated. This is some groovy code that is firing off and solving for 2048. So that's what he was talking about. Perfect. All automated. All right. Back to this. So as I said, Jeb is based on WebDriver. Has anyone used Selenium? Does that ring a bell for anyone? Yeah. So Selenium had a couple, couple products. They had the original Selenium, uh, and they had a Firefox plugin called Selenium IDE, where a little UI where you could kind of like browse, and it would record a, a session, and then you could save that as like an XML file and run that in some automated form later, right? So that was kind of Selenium 1.0, um, or the original Selenium. Um, the next version, Selenium RC, they made some stuff better. Um, Selenium 2.0 is actually WebDriver, right? So uh, WebDriver is kind of the successor to, the, to uh, Selenium. They also have like a grid uh, abil uh, function too where you can install it on a cluster of uh, machines and configure you know, your, your tests to go be run out on this other grid. Still might be useful for, for uh, some of this Jeb stuff, too. Okay. So WebDriver, the whole concept of WebDriver is you've got code driving a real web browser, like a real one, not just this HTML unit making HTTP requests and trying to reinterpret JavaScript and figure out you know, what happened. Um, this, is, this is how your users use your application, right? They have a real browser, they click around in it, they you know, drag and drop some things, they um, you know, upload images, all of that. So you can emulate all of that in code, right? So they have support for uh, Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, PhantomJS, HTML unit, Android, even iOS, so, so even mobile browsers have this. Yeah, I don't see, um, I don't see any BlackBerry up here, but you know, relics of the past. <laughs> so here's an example of just raw web driver, just a simple example off of their, off their site, right? So 
pretty simple. You create a new web driver. So this one's the HTML unit driver. And then you get a URL, so the get request, you recognize that. And then you use this find by element. So that looks a lot like the JavaScript find by element, right? So you're finding a queue by name. And you're going to get a web element. And then you're going to take that element. You're going to send the, the keys cheese. And then you're going to submit the element, which is going to cause the form to be uh, submitted. And then it's going to uh, wait for that to, I think the submit's going to wait and print out the title. And that's it. You see how this is kind of like a procedural, like do one thing and then kind of do, do another. And it's, it's, you know, very manual process. So that was, that was WebDriver, right? And that's the underlying library or framework we're talking about, we're building on. So uh, Jeb is built on top, of, on top of WebDriver. And we're talking about uh, using Jeb in Grails. So there's a, a Grails plugin. Uh, the Jeb plugin, uh, you can uh, in your build config add this uh, parameter or add this in your um, plugins block. Um, it could be test instead of compile, I believe, uh, but that's just what the plugin page recommended. So in order to get uh, set up, right, uh, you install the plugin and build config, and then you also um, that's, that's not all you have to do. You've got to set up a couple of other additional pieces. Uh, you've got to set up the actual drivers themselves, the instances of the drivers you're going to use, right? So um, you haven't chose what browser you're going to use. So you, you need to import the web driver instance for, if you're going to use Chrome, you import the Chrome driver. If you're going to use Firefox, you import the Firefox driver, et cetera, right? Um, and then, to get support for Jeb Spock, you would do this, and support for Jeb JUnit, you'd uh, pull in that dependency. Also, you can configure um, the browser per environment, right? So uh, there's a special Jeb config, which actually I believe you can use config.groovy now, um, where you can configure the actual driver that you use, right? So in other words, on my local machine, I'm using uh, Chrome, but maybe in our CI server, it's using Firefox, right? So you might have a different environment, you know, use different uh, uh, plugins. Also here, note that um, when you do a test app, right, you can run uh, jeb.env of Chrome Right? And then it will use the Chrome driver here because it's configured in Jeb config. Or you could be Jeb, Jeb ENV, you know, Firefox. And then it would use the Firefox driver. So you can run your tests uh, with different uh, parameters. So let's look at a, a simple example. Um, and this example is found on Jeb's site. Um, go to you know, github.com slash Jeb, and there's a couple examples. There's a Grails example there. So we're going to take a look at that quick. So I've pulled down this example here into in IntelliJ, and here's an example spec of uh, a Jeb, Jeb spec, basically. Notice this uh, person crud spec extends Jeb reporting spec. We'll get to the reporting in a minute. So this is, a, this is a test, pretty simple. When I go to the listing page, then there are no people. And the next test is you add a person, right? So when there's a new person button, when you click that, then we're at the create page. And this happens you know, really fast. There's not a whole lot of weight that involved there. Um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, keep in mind in uh, Spock, this stepwise annotation right here is um, ex executing every one of these tests in order, right? So uh, the first test happens before the second and so on and, and so forth. So it's an ongoing story where each test is just one step in the chain. So let's execute these. So Grails test app. I have a little 
alias for that. Actually, that would help. Do you see that okay? So it's going to fire off, uh, compile, and run these tests, right? So Jeb tests are functional tests, which means that it has to launch the whole entire app, right? That's the, that's the definition of functional testing. You launch the entire app, and then you test it kind of from the outside, rather than testing one little unit of work or just a couple units of work. Oh, see that it fired off a, uh, it created a browser. All right, now what's it going to do? Give it a second here to finish loading. And now it's going through each one of those steps and just zipping right through. Boom, 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 boom. So that was, we executed how many tests? Nine Spock tests and zero failed and one functional test. Um, and boom, they passed. Yay, and then we can look at the reports right here. So pretty simple, we'll come back to the reports in the spec in, in a minute. So that's the basics of it, right? It's built into Grail's test app. You um, run it just a, like you would on the CI server with your test app, you run it locally, and you saw what it took. Okay, so let's get a little bit into the mechanics of, uh, of Jeb itself, right? So we said that Jeb was WebDriver plus this like content, jQuery like content selection piece plus, um, uh, let's see, Groovy plus um, a page object model, right? So let's look at the content selection. So within, within a uh, Jeb test, we can, the first one here, would look for an anchor tag with a class of brand, right? So that would match all of those within the, the given page that the web driver is at right then. It will return them to you and then you can, you know, say find the first, you know, find the first one and then click on it. Or, you know, do anything a user could do there. Or move the mouse there or hover over or do, do whatever you need to there. Or the second one is, you know, any div with some class, um, and then you're looking for the first P with the title of something, first paragraph tag with the title of something within this, right? That looks familiar to you if you've done, you know, any sort of uh, jQuery-like um, uh, selector uh, querying, right? Or the bottom one, you can, look within the div dot footer. So the, a div with a class of footer, you're trying to find anything with a copyright class in it, for example. It makes it pretty expressive, right? You know, if you semantically mark up your, your pages, you can have a very clear, you know, um, reference to these things in here. And we'll see how the page object model makes that even better. Um, the next step is we can interact with the actual page. So you can uh, take one of these elements and click on it. You know, you click on the first link, the first anchor tag, right? And then as soon as you click on it, it will go and do its thing. So if it's a link, it'll take you there. And then you can do assertions that you're at the next page after you've clicked on it, if that makes sense. You can send keystrokes. Here's a couple. Of, here's an example of uh, finding an input with the name of first name, and then sending the keystrokes ASDF into that. Yep, you get you get the idea. Um, I, that has to be a string. That's my bad. Um, or here's an example where you are doing a key combination, right? Where you're doing a control and a C, right? So you're, you've clicked on it, now you're doing a control C, so you're copying whatever's th there. So you can do some unique things. Whatever uh, a user can do in a web browser, you can do here for the most part. So keep in mind, WebDriver is not about testing you know, the HTTP protocol. It's not ab about making sure that it, the response code was 200 or that, um, uh, that you've got a specific header or you know, that, that type of thing on the, the, the traffic going back and forth. 
That's not really the purpose. The purpose of WebDriver is to emulate what a user would do. If you want, want to do things like um, test a, a RESTful API or that type of thing, you'll use, you'll use something else. You'll use a different tool. There's uh, better tools for something like that. Um, there's a lot of power in the WebDriver API you can use directly right there. You can get access right, right to the driver uh, in your test. Um, you can do things like actions and drag and drop, control clicking, you know, basically anything you can do uh, that, that a user can do for the most part. You know, there's, I'm sure there are some edges, you know, like the scrolling and that type of thing. Um, I believe there is some support in the iOS versions for like multi-touch, you know, like drag and drop and, you know, pinch and that, those type of um, triggers. So if you're interested in that, you know, take a look at that. You can get access to that. So here at the bottom, here's an example of clicking and holding on an element and then dragging your mouse uh, by 400 and negative 150, right? So 400 and negative 150. Okay. And then releasing it, right? So drawing a circle on a map or, you know, like selecting an area of text and whatever. So if you need to emulate that, if your web application has some rich UI components, you're still not lost. You can use some of this stuff. So far, we've just looked at uh, static content. Um, uh, Jeb has uh, built into it a waiting uh, paradigm, right? You can wait for something to be eventually uh, true, right? So if you click on something that does an AJAX call, you can wait for the loading indicator to be gone before you do the next step, or you can um, wait for a, an element to be present. Uh, there's a default timeout to it, right? So you're like, for example, the uh, the first one's just going to use the default configuration. Here you're actually saying wait for up to 10 seconds for the thing in the, parent, the, in the closure to return true, right? So it will check. There's like a retry interval that it, uh, that's set up there. And it retries. Look at the, the next one is uh, to wait for 10 seconds and retry every half second. Pre pretty simple. Um, and then there's uh, a preset right here. So you can configure, you know, like a quick, fast, slow, you know, your millisecond based, I don't know. Okay. Uh, and then this is a, an example of uh, w what you would do, right? You make a request, I guess. Uh, let's see. You set a value and then you wait for the result of this div to be present. So if this right here, if, if by changing this input to make a result, make request, um, causes something else to happen that puts a div result into the page, this will wait for that div result to show up and to be present, right? Pretty straightforward. And then you're asserting the results of that div, for example. Next step you can do is you can, there's this special JS object, which is uh, kind of a JavaScript bridge. It kind of does a, a couple things. Uh, you have access to anything you have in the global scope in JavaScript, right? So any functions that are there, you can call on that JS uh, object or any um, global variables you can see there. Um, granted, that's not a very good uh, pattern, but you can still at least do it. So for example, um, you could do JS document dot title and that will execute basically and look at, look at the actual document title uh, of the uh, window class or the, the global class there and verify that it's that. Um, or if you've got a function that's globally available, you can call it here uh, with parameters and they'll get you know, classified and sent out and executed within the browser space. So under the hood, um, this gets, uh, goes over the JavaScript bridge into the actual uh, dr web driver. Um, there's also support to execute arbitrary uh, JavaScript. So js.execute, uh, or exec, execute anything. You can feed it a string. Um, for example, you can feed it like, here, here we're passing in two arguments, one and two. 
and then it um, basically creates a function and we're or no, it basically creates a function and adds them together and we're asserting that in JavaScript this is going to execute and return the return value right here and then we're evalu evaluating that that's true. So you can kind of test your um, JavaScript code or states of things if it's uh, available to you. Kind of useful. The next part is um, uh, Jeb has support for jQuery built into it, which means that um, we can do, um, you, we could always do this js.exec jQuery and call jQuery, right? That gets a little bit, you know, ceremonious. There's some um, little issues with return types here and um, that being wrapped in function and that type of thing. Um, but this is roughly equivalent to um, calling a selector dot jQuery and then anything that jQuery can do. So it's basically wrapping that in a jQuery object, if that makes sense. It's a bunch of other things you can do. You can direct download, like if you've got a report generation application and you're inputting a bunch of fields and you're verifying that, that, that um, the filter works correctly and that when you hit the export button that it downloads and Excel document that you can, you know, you get access to that and parse it, make sure it's not empty and make sure it has the right rows and all that stuff, right? So if you want to go to that level, you can totally do that. Um, it has support for alert, confirm. Um, there is uh, some support for handling multiple tabs and multiple windows. Um, that gets into some more advanced type of stuff. Um, there's support for uh, untrusted certificates, which as it turns out is more of an issue with um, our testing environments because um, some of our testing environments, because we're spinning up many, many instances on these grids, uh, might not have like a wildcard cert that's valid or something like that. So untrusted certs are um, not necessarily strange in a, in a testing environment. You're not necessarily going to put in the effort to you know, fix all that and set, that, set all that up. So you can code around that. There's stuff around that. Uh, and then you, you still have access, because Jeb is a layer on top of WebDriver, you still have access to the actual web driver underneath the hood. So anything regular old web driver can do, you've got, you've got the browser, you've got the driver. The next good, good uh, part, okay, so Jeb is web driver plus groovy plus this page object pattern, right? So this separates it from some of the other uh, tools, automated tools that are out there. So the concept here is um, it's kind of like OO, you know. The web driver thing that we saw earlier was a very procedural, right? You were creating a new web driver and then you were telling it to drive to this page and then you were telling it to click on this item, right? That's very procedural, right? This is kind of an object-oriented pattern where we can navigate to a given page, right? So here's the execution of it. We're telling the browser to drive to uh, Google homepage. Right? So how does Google Homepage know where, know where it is? Well, that's because we have a URL. And in the Grails context, we'd have a base URL and the URI to tack onto that, if that makes sense. Um, but when we go to Google Homepage, it knows how to, where it needs to go to get to that point. Right? And then look at the next line, search Chuck Norris. So we have this search function right here, which takes a term and looks for the search field and sets the value to search term and then clicks the search button. Pretty straightforward. This gives us a very clean looking test. So notice we didn't have to say um, you, uh, browser dot drive to this URL and then browser dot you know click on this other object and uh, enter enter the search term and then click the button. No, we just said search because that's how we think about it, right? So this gives you a, a more expressive uh, means to um, test your code. If you notice this uh, content block here. Um, that's another component of the page object model is that you can specify for a given page, or a Jeb page, 
it has a static content block, which means that um, those pieces are properties of this page. So you can do page dot search field and do things with that search field. So here we're quantifying what the selector is to get the search field. So here the search field is the input whose name is Q, right? <coughs> CSS selector, pretty straightforward. And then the search button, um, we're verifying that the search button brings you to the Google page re results page and the selector for this is input with a value is Google search. So then we can access the search field just by going page.search field. So this is a very simple example. You could imagine a, big, a bigger example where you've got like a uh, user registration form with like 10 different items uh, and uh, you'll want to be able to access them pretty, pretty quickly. And keep in mind these selectors are pretty simple right now. You might have a longer, uh, longer string to find, you know, the search form and then the second part of it and then the whatever input names, whatever. The, so we've got the pages, we've got content on those pages or kind of properties, and then we have this other reusable thing called modules, right? So most, most web pages we go to these days have uh, usually like a login button, right? You, like to upper right, you know, you have that login section where it's like your account and like when you're not logged in, it's got a login button and when you do log in, it's got like, welcome so-and-so, here's, you know, like click here to edit your profile or click here to log out, that type of thing, right? That's on every single page. So you don't want to bake that into every single hierarchy, page hierarchy. Um, you you want that to be like a reusable template, right? So that's what these model modules are. Is a reusable module or a reusable template uh, within your page page models. Which brings up a, a a good point that the page pattern. You notice the Google Home page extends page. Well, there might be another custom. Google homepage, you know, like a, a new doodle Google homepage, which extends Google homepage, right? You can have these hierarchy of pages that kind of extend one another. So you could have a, a generic, like, you know, publicly accessible something other, something or other page. And then you can have a very specific uh, a form page which ref re that has like something on the side and it has like a submit button and then you might have like a specific forms page which quantifies all the things in it, right? You can see how you can build a hierarchy of OO which represents your domain effectively. And then you can reuse those pieces that are cross-cutting into multiple areas in uh, modules. All right. So we've got pages, we've got content, and we've got modules. All right, pretty rich framework so far. So on top of that, we have this uh, uh, thing called a reporter, right? So these reporters are going to give us uh, some sort of history on what happened with this. You can configure the reporter to only report when there's a failure, right? You can, you can configure it to be quiet except for when it's uh, a failure or you can have it always report on every, every test. So here's an example where um, you're setting the report group to Google, you're telling it to go to google.com and then you're doing a report for homepage. And what this will do is create um, a Google folder in the reports directory and it will create a homepage report, whatever the report, reporter is. So there's a couple different reporters. There's a screenshot reporter, there's a page source reporter, right? So screenshot is, is going to take a screenshot of the actual browser right then and there. And uh, the page source is going to just rip out the source like you're, you know, just doing view source and save it right there. So when something blows up, you can be like, okay, I, what was going on here? What, what was sitting, <laughs> what, did, what did the HTML look like? And then you can open it up and see like, oh yeah, there was a server error. It was clearly, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you might have it exposed to the stack exception or something like that. Or a screenshot, you might be able to see very clearly, oh, wait a minute, that took me to the wrong page. I wasn't expecting that and find your breakage. And we'll look at the, the ones we just executed a minute ago. 
Reporters are kind of interesting. They have um, their own separate reports directory. Uh, there's a set of listeners on them so that you can uh, maybe hook up a registry or do some other interesting things with that. That's for, for later. And then you can clean out the whole report groups directory, for example. Pretty simple. Um, by default, uh, there's a combined reporter. There's a screenshot and page source reporter out there that uh, is used by default, I believe. So in the Grails context, um, when you run your tests in the target folder, in the test reports under, a, under Jeb, that's where your test reports are going to be. So let's go check out what we did earlier. Remember that run that, that we ran earlier? So here I can go Google Chrome, targets, <coughs> test reports. Yeah, let's just do this. So if I fire up Nautilus or the file browser, I see in the test reports, you know, we're familiar with the HTML test reports. Um, but then there's this other Jeb folder which contains the, uh, each one of our specs. You see the person crud spec and the person crud tests are two different groups. Does that make sense? So these, this, uh, th this level is the reporting group. So the crud spec you see we've got a set of HTML documents and screenshots. So let's just take a look at the screenshots while we're at it. So here's the screenshot at the end of the first step, and then at the end of the second step, and at the end of the third step. So you can see how you can configure um, a, a very interactive you know, history of how you got to where you are, right? And have a visual trail of where you're at. It's very useful. And if we, if we remember that, it just zipped through it. It just went through it. It looked kind of like that, right? <laughs> just zipping through these tests. And then we have the, the actual HTML source. It'd be fun to write something that uh, dumped the JavaScript, you know, the, the data underneath or something like that. It's totally doable, right? So that's the reports directory. You know, I, I was at a, a company uh, a little while ago where um, we actually had a really good, uh, we had an interview engine that we, we wrote. So think about uh, an interview where you'd have like 30 to anywhere from realistically 20 to like 40, 50 questions, right? So logical paths through this. Um, we ended up uh, writing, uh, using Jeb, writing like uh, on top of Jeb, a nice little um, syntactic sugar that a business person could, or a QA person with no coding experience could understand. All right, click next, you know, and, you know, and answer this question with this value, that type of thing, and verify that the title is this. So as soon as we gave him a couple examples, he was able to help us go through and do some of the permutation and path testing through that. So we actually gave him source code rights to that area in code, and uh, uh, had him generate a ton of different um, tests that actually uh, succeeded, right? So that was one aspect of, of the story. Um, giving him source code access and then hooked it up to Jenkins so that he could commit the code, push the code, and run, run the tests from Jenkins. He didn't have to have anything set up on his local machine. He could just have a text editor that you know, roughly did the syntax highlighting for Groovy, right? And that worked out quite, quite well. The other thing I did for that, that project was I wrote a, a custom uh, reporter that aggregated each of these steps, right? So you think about like one path through this was uh, 20 different steps. So it created a little like light, light box where you could just keep clicking through and see all of the steps until it blew up or, you know, or until you, it completed. So that was very successful, um, and I feel like uh, Jeb is almost there where, uh, you know, that pattern could be repeated by uh, other business folks, where you get, you get business folks who can take an example groovy code and, and uh, copy it and get something meaningful out of it. All right, that rants aside. <laughs> uh, remote web driver. 
Okay, so we've been talking about doing WebDriver locally, right? So I fire off my tests and it runs a local Chrome instance and it drives that Chrome instance. Well, you can set up a remote WebDriver where you're running the, the WebDriver over here, but then you've got a client and server. So the actual browser is on another machine, for example. So it effectively, um, you would launch the uh, WebDriver uh, client um, or server, I mean, over on uh, somewhere. It opens and listens on a port, and it listens for commands so over, over that port. So it's got its own you know, protocol handling those commands. And it runs, runs just fine over that. So this is how you do something like, um, well, I'm running on Linux here, right? So how would I run Internet Exploder? Well, I wouldn't. I would have to connect to a remote you know, box somewhere in some VM or whatever, where Windows belongs. Uh, and uh, <laughs> maybe opinionated, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, uh, execute this and take screenshots and be able to run the different permutations of browsers. That's really handy for um, if you need to test like the major versions of Firefox or just Chrome, Firefox, and uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, there's a good uh, uh, article here on building out automated um, web applications with an iPad or iPhone with iOS, right? You can actually test on your mobile, mobile device. You can set up a little web driver on a mobile device and drive it through your web application. Super sweet. Or there's a company that's set all this stuff up for you. There's actually a couple of them, but uh, Sauce Labs has done some uh, good, good work in this area. Uh, they're worth checking out. They're kind of like a pay for uh, pay to play model, uh, free for open source projects, I believe, that type of thing. Um, check them out, they're on Sauce Labs. The beautiful thing about these guys, a couple things that I really appreciate. They actually take a video of your testing sessions. Right? So you run a test and you have a, a video that you can like watch on their website of that specific run, which is sweet, right? You run your, <laughs> you run your you know, Jenkins test or whatever it is and it fires off and runs in their cloud and you can literally click into their video and watch exactly what happened and get all the details from that. That's super sweet. Also, uh, there's another issue with, um, um, We'll get back to that one. They also support most major desktop versions, both operating system and uh, browser versions. So um, if you need a, a lot of coverage, that's a good solution. They support uh, mobile browsing. If you've ever Android, Android can be a pain to test on mobile. Anyone? Anyone attest to that? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so they have a, uh, a plethora of um, uh, Android versions and, and uh, devices you can test against there. So go check them out if you're interested in that. Uh, the third issue that uh, is, is important to note is when you are doing um, a test, uh, the mechanics of it is there's a client and a server, right? You launch your web application and then you've got a web driver and then you've got the remote web driver, right? So the thing that's actually controlling the, controlling the browser. You've got your test that's firing commands to the thing that's running the browser. But then the thing that's running the browser has to be able to see the web application. So for a lot of people, you're behind a corporate firewall or you can't really expose what you're doing to the World Wide Web for anyone to do this for a third-party cloud service, right? So what, you're gonna have your network admin open up a port and do some redirection? No, that's just too messy. So uh, what these guys did, actually, they did a, like a reverse SSH tunnel so that you know, when you're running this, ses this uh, session, um, it, will create an, it will open a port just directly to them, and that's it. So they have access to see your web application locally running on your Jenkins server or locally or whatever. It's pretty sweet. Or you could roll your own, I mean, if you really wanted to and you have all that time to do that. Um, I mean, nothing is stopping you from getting a bunch of physical devices and installing, you know, the web driver on it and uh, executing them, but it sounds like a lot of work. Um, 
I want to redirect you to um, Marcin Erdman's uh, advanced Jeb talk at <laughs> Skills Matter. He, uh, he does a good job with, uh, with that. Um, a little bit of history on, on the pr uh, project. Luke Daly has handed the, the keys over to Marcin just recently. Uh, and there's a 1.0 version coming at some time. I'm not going to promise it for him. So. <laughs> um, sometimes you need to run these things in parallel, right? So rather than running one test, if you've got a suite of like 1,500 tests, running them one after another after another is just, it takes too much time. Especially if you're killing the browser every time and starting up a new browser. That's a lot of recycling. Um, there's some other ways you can get around that by sharing instances and just manually logging out and that type of thing. But um, clear, clearing cookies and doing all that. But um, there's, there are other patterns. And Thomas Lin has a good uh, blog post about how, uh, how you could run them in parallel. Another option is to shard them. Like you can say, let's run these tests you know, uh, on one instance and these, uh, this package of tests on another instance and you know, run them all in parallel yourself. That's another option. Uh, third piece, uh, in Jenkins, most of our Linux boxes running Jenkins are headless, right? They're in the cloud, they're on some VM box, that type of thing. So you have to install the X virtual frame buffer to get an actual UI, right? Because the browser needs an actual like, display to paint on so that it can run the browser. So you have to do this virtual frame, frame buffer thing. It's not too hard. Uh, there's some good Google foo out there. Uh, one of the last things I want to mention is there is a remote control plugin as well. Um, the whole principle of functional testing is um, uh, you, you spin up your application and you test it from the outside. Whereas unit testing, you've got like one little unit of work and you mock out everything else around it and you just test that one little unit. Integration testing is like, I got these two things, I'm putting them together, and then I'm testing the things together. Uh, functional testing is like, I'm starting the app just like I w would in production, roughly, and I'm going to hit it from the outside with a real browser with real HTTP requests, right? So remote control allows you to um, write a, a closure, serialize that, and run that within the app. Because sometimes you need to seed some data or you know, put something there that you're going to execute, right? So you kind of need to have your hand in the app and externally at the same time. So you could use the remote control plugin to uh, do some of that as well. Um, another thing I found kind of interesting, this uh, Siguli, or I don't even know how to say that, um, plugin was uh, visually walking your, um, your uh, browser session, basically. So you're looking for an image, for example. I think there's some more work to be done around doing image comparison, like verify that this button is shown and give it an image, versus most of our testing now is like using a CSS selector or um, using um, just a straight, I mean, you could do a straight image compare, but there's, there, I feel like there needs to be some, some tools out there that uh, does like a rough image compare, that the colors are roughly the same, that these images still show up and they're not missing, that type of thing. Testing UX and the look and feel. Uh, any questions? Uh, in the back. So you're, you need unique usernames and passwords? Yes. So you need to share that same username and password? And you're asking if uh, there's a, a mechanism to share?
Mhm. Yes, yeah, so you could you could do that. You could read that in um, via your test framework, and uh, do exactly what you're talking about. Let's let's talk afterward. I want to hear more about what you're uh, what you're asking there. Oh. Thank you.